Hi, I'm Andrew Eels, and in this short film I'm going to be looking at the piano music of Felix Rybitsky, a Polish composer, conductor and pianist who was born in Warsaw in 1899 and died there in 1978. Rybitsky was not just a composer and musician but also a great educator. He taught uh, choral training in secondary schools, comprehensive schools, as well as in specialist music academies as well. He has the distinction of writing music, which is not only attractive, imaginative and engaging for the player, but which is also full of pedagogic content, meaning that there are just so many good teaching ideas that, that we can use when introducing this music to children. A lot of Rybitsky's music is published by PWM Edition, and I have with me three books that form a trilogy of piano books for younger children. There's I Begin to Play, which is the book I'm going to be talking about today. But also in the series we have I Am Already Playing the Piano, and I love the title of this one, I Can Play Everything for Piano. I Begin to Play is written for elementary players, and it contains 26 pieces spread across 32 pages. It's attractively presented. We've got a few black and white line drawings in here which give the book a little more appeal and which children can colour in, of course. It's not a method book. It's a book of pieces that we can use alongside any method of our choice. And they ranged from the very simple at the beginning of the collection through to more difficult pieces as the collection progresses. The first piece, for example, uses both hands in a C position. Both are written in the treble clef. Um, so we have middle C with the left hand and written as it sounds, an octave higher the right hand. And we're playing in contrary motion. And so on. As the book progresses, you'll see the pieces quite quickly get harder. I'm going to come and look at some of these in more detail in a minute. Once we get to the ninth piece in the book, this is called In a Boat. I think English uh, teachers will probably recognise this as a piece that was set for grade one a few years ago. Here's the beginning. You maybe remember that. And then when we get to the end of the book, the pieces are perhaps approaching towards grade two. We have... Uh, Pieces with 16th notes, semiquavers, chromatic sort of passage in this, or in G major here. Um, so we need a certain finger dexterity by that point in the book. So I'm going to pick out a few pieces from this collection, which I particularly enjoyed when playing through them all, uh, and which I think are especially useful in teaching. I'm going to start back at the beginning, and we'll look at a quarrel. This piece, like the first piece, is written with both hands in a C position, mostly in contrary motion again, but this time there's a few moments where it changes, so have a listen. Ah, there it was. You see? We're not in contrary motion anymore. And the player who's just trying to copy a demonstration might get stuck at that point because it's a test to see if we're really reading the notes. The second half of the piece actually copies the same pattern. But when we get to the end, the final two bars are even more of an interesting challenge. Have a listen. So we need some real finger independence there because the hands are doing very different things. Of course, it's also a lovely tune, isn't it? Now, let's look on. Just one page on a swing and we're already away from that five note position. We also have chromatic notes, um, an A flat here, and some stretches that are quite interesting. I'll play you the first half. When we look at uh, the end of that phrase, the lovely chromatic moment there, um, we have an interesting stretch because the fingering shown, we have five, four, 
and then the thumb on the A flat sliding to the G. But then also indicated as an alternative, if we're able to reach with the second finger for the A flat, and then tuck, then we can tuck the thumb under for the G. But there's still a stretch of an octave for the next note, and back up to the F. So already at this stage in the book, we're playing pieces that require a little bit more technique, moving away from that five note position and including more music reading knowledge. I'm now going to look on to the stalk. The stalk is just eight bars long, leaving plenty of room on the page for this lovely little drawing, one of my favorites in the book. If we can see the score for the stalk, straight away we notice that what's going on in this piece is that the right hand and left hand have different articulation to each other. The right hand has, in fact, a range of slurs and other articulation that I'll talk about in a moment, while the left hand accompanies the tune using quavers, eighth notes, with rests in between each one, so detached notes. Looking at this right hand phrasing, I'll play you the first line. So in that short passage, we've had a slur for legato playing. We've had a dot at the end of a phrase, which is where we lift off, float off at the end of a phrase there. Staccato notes, we've had an accent here and again here, and a tenuto sign on the final G. One of the interesting things about all of that detail is that it actually forces us not to play with an emphasis on the first beat of the bar, but actually to have a more interesting musical expression here. And when we put in the left hand with its detached quavers, things get even more interesting. So as a piece, it's both charming and enjoyable, but also it has such pedagogy, such teaching and learning opportunity in it, giving us this chance to really help even the youngest player realize the potential of using different articulations to add expression and interest to their playing. As we continue moving through the book, you'll see that there are now uh, several tunes with the bass clef. We begin to have key signatures in some of these pieces, G major, F major. The next piece I want to look at is in F major, uh, and it's called Sad Autumn. This piece is also in 6-8 time, so at this stage we've learnt about compound time, um, and I would say this piece is, is probably post-grade one, something after that. So we're well into the elementary playing phase at this point. I'll play you the first line because I think you're going to love the harmony in this. Now maybe you noticed in that, that rather than simply playing the left hand as written, I was holding the notes, a technique we sometimes call finger peddling, uh, in order to make chords out of the notes. This gives a really rich resonance to the harmony in the piece, but it also supports the right hand tune because it softens the impact of each note in the left hand. It helps the left hand gel and really come together. So that when we put that right hand tune in, it soars above that, that harmonic foundation. At this stage in learning the piano, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's never too early to talk about cantable, the singing tone, and making the piano not just a percussive sound, 
but a singing musical sound. Sad Autumn, such an evocative title, but a great piece to talk about playing cantable. As I continue to turn the pages of the book, we'll see that the pieces keep getting more difficult until we get to, towards the end, Gypsy Dance. Uh, and this is the first piece here, which includes 16th notes, semiquavers. And I suspect a lot of children will want to play this piece as fast as they possibly can. But there's a trap, because when we get to the second line, some of these semiquavers are actually marked staccato. And that's going to be very difficult to play evenly at that speed. So this is a perfect opportunity to talk to students about finding the right speed for a piece. The speed at which all of the music works well, and uh, rather than rushing into a piece at a speed where it's going to fall apart. Right next to it is probably my favourite piece in the whole book, and this is called A Wish. And I'm going to finish by playing you this piece, simply because I love it, and I think you will too. Children who enjoy playing these pieces will undoubtedly equally enjoy the other two books in the trilogy. Rybitsky's music is a wonderful addition to the children's piano literature. I feel he's right up there with Kabalevsky and other composers of that time, contributing something that's of genuine value. Um, and I hope that you'll share this music with students if you're a teacher, and that you'll enjoy it, because it's wonderful stuff. Thank you for watching.